I have people, so in the last video we were talking about the political challenges that these new Latin American countries face. Today we're going to talk about the economic challenges um, that these new Latin American countries are facing. So we're going to talk about this question here. How was Latin American economy impacted um, by independence? So once these countries gained their freedoms by the 1820s, 1830s, they wanted to get diplomatic recognition. So it's all good and fine to say that, okay, we are free, but if all the other countries in the world do not acknowledge the fact that you are free, then you really don't have independence. Um, so they sought diplomatic recognition. Um, so they had to kind of go to the great powers of Europe and see who would actually agree and kind of say, yes, we do acknowledge you as independent. The issue was, and if you remember this from eighth grade, in, um, it would be actually seventh grade in American history, Spain wanted to try to recolonize their colonies. And they did have a decent amount of support from this from some of the other European nations. So these new independent Latin American countries were trying to get a big country like Great Britain, which was becoming pretty much the major power in the world in the 19th century, to acknowledge them as independent. And the British did. They opposed this idea of recolonizing Latin America, and they acknowledged that these countries were free and independent countries. As a result, Britain got a lot of economic benefits from doing this. Britain is not just going to, out of the kindness of their heart, say, yes, we're going to help out these poor new countries um, and help them to become independent. So the British foreign minister, a man by the name of Lord Canning, at the time said, Spanish America is free, and if we do not mismanage our affairs, sadly, she is English. And what essentially him meant by that is, you know, we'll give you diplomatic recognition, we'll protect you from being recolonized by Spain in return for free trade with these new nations. And so what that means is no tariffs. So usually when a country trades with another country, they make money off of the tariffs they charge. So goods are being imported, they charge it, they issue a tariff or a tax, and that money then goes to the government. And these countries did not do that because this was the this was the deal. We'll acknowledge that you're free. You allow us to trade freely with your nations. So more than half of the foreign investments in South America were British, and that's going to go up ten times between 1870 and 1913. This is going to be something that's referred to as neo-colonialism. Now, neo means new, so this is essentially the new colonialism. So in essence, what, what the South American countries do is they trade up Spain as their mother country for Britain as their mother country. So now, Britain technically is not governing South America politically. They're independent states. But economically, they're still in that mercantilistic relationship where the, uh, South America is providing low-cost natural resources to Britain, Britain is then manufacturing them, and in turn, Britain is then shipping those goods back to South America. So South America is providing resources and markets for Great Britain. Now, what this did is this really constrained the Latin American government um, because they were kind of bound to Britain. It's also going to constrain their ability to really grow their economy because they're going to be stuck in this um, cash crop economy and not really then growing industry or their own, you know, like their own economy in any real significant way. So this is really going to be a downside for Britain in the long term. So if we look at um, a lot of these countries in South America, even today, you don't see a lot of industry. And the reason why you don't see a lot of industry is because of the way the system was set up. They still were just producing raw materials, single crops um, for the more developed countries of Europe, Britain, and then also the United States. So in the long run, this really hurt um, these countries. Now, as far as America, so we are going to play a big role in South America because we see this area kind of like as our domain. And so we have kind of a very troubled sometimes relationship with South America. Um, so if we look here, this map here just kind of shows us kind of intervening in South America, all of the interventions. So the Spanish-American War in the late 1800s, we're going to get as a result um, Cuba. We are going to get involved in 
fights in Haiti. We are going to get involved in fights in Panama in regards to the Panama Canal because Panama was originally part of Colombia. This was originally part of one country. We wanted to build the Panama Canal to make it easier for us to trade um, east to west um, in our own country. The Colombians weren't too interested in building the Panama Canal, so we helped to uh, push for a rebellion in Panama. We supported the rebellion knowing that once Panama got us freedom from Colombia, Panama would give us land to build the Panama Canal. And so that's how we were able to build the Panama Canal. Our, also, our first military intervention ever using the Air Force is actually going to be in Mexico. Um, and I mentioned on the previous video that there's a lot of unfinished problems that, that are never really dealt with once the countries get their independence. Mexico is one of those areas. There's a revolution in Mexico in the early 1900s. We are going to intervene in, that Mex in the Mexican Revolution. And like I said, it's going to be the first time we ever use the Air Force, by the way. Um, and then if we see here now, you know, today, Puerto Rico still is part of the United States. The Virgin Islands are still part of the United States. So we started kind of building up a little bit of our colonial empire. For a while, Cuba was part of the United States. So we kind of dominated affairs in the Americas. So in 1823, President Monroe issues the Monroe Doctrine. Now, the thing about the Monroe Doctrine is the only reason why we were able to actually get the Monroe Doctrine, not get the release, but anyone actually listened to the Monroe Doctrine. And if you remember what it is, it basically, we declare that the South American countries are free. We are going to help to maintain their independence. Spain and the other European countries should stay on their side of the world. We'll stay on our side of the world. This, you know, South America is no longer a, you know, European domain. Um, basically telling Europe to like, you know, keep their hands off of Latin America and South America. The only reason why this worked, because we were not very much a big power at this point, is because the British were also standing up and recognizing um, the freedom of these South American countries. But then I remember I mentioned this um, in class the other day in the 1840s. We have the Mexican-American War. And as a result, uh, we get the Mexican Session and then also we had gotten Texas. We had a next Texas previously, um, in which we gained, you know, the whole southwest of the United States. We get independence for Cuba in the Spanish-American War. Remember the main? You probably know that from eighth grade. Um, and then President Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, added the Roosevelt Corollary um, to the Monroe Doctrine. Speak softly, carry a big stick. And so we sent troops into Cuba, Haiti, Mexico, Honduras, all these different places. And we also built the Panama Canal. Um, so you can see the, the land here that was, at, for a brief point, actually part of the United States. We built this canal and, as a result, was able to collect the money off of the, um, um, what you call it, the tolls going through the locks. And there you see President Roosevelt kind of asserting his power over... Um, the Caribbean. So if we look here in talking about this whole concept of neocolonialism and economic imperialism, if we look at all of these goods that are going out, coffee, tobacco, cacao, cattle, rubber, cotton, sugar, uh, beef, wheat, wool, copper, all of these things are, like I was saying before, are natural resources. Um, and what we have going in, railways, finance, um, investment in government bonds. So Britain and the U.S. is investing a lot of money, in particular to build up the infrastructure in order to make it possible to be able to trade easily with these countries. Um, the port cities benefited because they had, you know, big custom houses that were built. Um, railroads were built, but the railroads were funded um, by Britain so that Britain could better get removed the natural resources from South America. And what we see is that each country pretty much has its particular um, specialty. So we have, if you look at Colombia, you know, coffee and tobacco. If we look at um, Venezuela, we have coffee, chocolate, and cattle. Um, if you look at the countries of Central America, which is not on this map, um, we have things like um, bananas, um, Rubber and coffee are coming from, you know, rubber and sugar and cotton are coming out of Brazil. Um, copper and silver is coming from Mexico. 
basically what this does is it damages whatever local industries there had been because there had been local industries producing goods for the local market. But now because of all of this investment, all of these natural resources going into Britain and the U.S. and all this investment that Britain and the U.S. is making to build up the infrastructure, these local markets are going to be flooded now with these cheap manufactured goods from Britain and the U.S. And it's really going to destroy um, the economies, the any hope of an industrial economy developing within these countries. Another thing that we have is they become known as what's called a banana republic. Now this is especially true for Central America. So the countries become so dependent on one particular export, for instance bananas, that they're not producing anything else and they are completely economically dominated by their major trading partner being either the US or Britain. And being so economically dominated means that they're also very much politically dominated. And we are going to intervene a lot of times in the governments of these countries if our economic interests aren't being protected, even if these governments might be doing what's best for the people in those countries, we're still going to intervene because of our economic interests. And so this is really not a good thing overall for South America. The other issue is if you're so dependent on one crop, like rubber is going to become a big thing, especially with industrialization. Um, because a lot of things are going to be made, you know, out of rubber as we move towards industry, especially once, you know, automobiles start being produced. But if like, also if you're producing, th if your major thing is copper, well, eventually copper is going to run out and then copper is going to run out and then your economy is going to be trashed. Or what happens if you're producing things like sugar and bananas, which are essentially luxury products. So you are very dependent on the fluctuations of the local market. You might have the best sugar, best banana crop you've ever had in, you know, your history as a farmer. But the economy is not doing well. You know, like the Great Depression in the 1930s, world markets have fallen, people can't afford to buy your good, and now your whole economy is trash. So what we have is a lot of these one single, not one, but single crop economies that are kind of focusing on luxury goods. And bottom line is that they are just very, very susceptible um, to the local, um, to not the local, excuse me, the world fluctuations in the economy. Now, some of these countries originally, when they had strong demand for these goods, they were making a lot of profits. And in some instances, when the economy was doing well, it allowed them to try to address certain social issues. Now, one of the interesting um, wars that we're going to see in South America is going to break out. In Peru, I'm going to change the color here so if we can see, this is Peru. Um, now Peru, there was an island off of Peru that was filled with what's something called guano, which is essentially bird dropping. So like the whole island was covered in bird poo. Um, but these bird droppings become fertilizer. This guano, it's full of nitrates and it becomes fertilizer. So between 1850 and 1860, this export of fertilizer for Peru allowed the Peruvians to abolish slavery. It allowed them to compensate their owners. They were able to make kind of large cultural changes going on in South America. However, the other countries around there kind of began to get jealous because if you see here, this right here is Chile, this is Bolivia, and this is Peru. And so the land right around here is where this island was, somewhere off the coast of this area. And this is going to break out into something called the War of the Pacific. And it's going to go from 1879 to 1883. And in the War of the Pacific, Chile, Peru, and Bolivia were fighting um, to gain control of these little islands filled with bird poo, essentially. Uh, so it was Chile against Bolivia and Peru. Bolivia lost land. And if you notice, if you notice, here is Bolivia, right? And you notice how there's a coastline of Chile that goes up here. Originally, this area here used to be part of Bolivia, and Bolivia used to have a seacoast. But now as a result of this war, the War of the Pacific, Chile became a landlocked nation. Um, and so Bolivia lost land. Chile increased its land by a third and had a major economic boom as a result, and Peru and Bolivia's governments fell. But the other issue that this kind of illustrates is 
yeah, guano is great, and they were making lots of money off of essentially bird poo, but eventually you're going to overmine all of the guano on the island, and they're going to run out of bird poo, and then the whole economy fell because they were in Peru, because they were so basing their economy on this one export that eventually they ran out of it because they overmined it, and it kind of like then created a you know, complete bottoming out of their economy. So let's just kind of show you this map here showing global investments um, in the U.S. investments in 1914. Um, so if we see here, this one on the left is global investments just in general for all of the United States. And so Latin America and the Caribbean is the largest chunk of global investments that we see, even more so than Canada or Europe. Now within that percentage, we see that most of the investments in Latin America from the U.S. were based on mining, so the extraction of raw materials, railroads, building up those raw materials, building up the railroads and the infrastructure and the public utilities in order to be able to extract the goods that are being mined. Just a little tiny section is manufacturing. They're not, we're not investing in things in South America that's going to allow the South American economy to grow. It's mostly being focused on the extraction of natural resources, mining and agriculture, oil, and then building up the infrastructure here to allow them to extract those things. And that's kind of what we see happening. And so as a result, these areas stay pretty much very agricultural and not very developed. So if you've ever been to a South American country, they're not very developed. There's not a lot of industry or going on within these countries. Um, so like I said before, cities began to grow because of some of the trade that was coming in in the 1840s and the 1860s when we really start to see uh, the building up of the infrastructure, steamship lines and railway lines um, linking exports to uh, ports. So the railway lines that are in the South American countries, they're not connecting like major cities to each other. So if you're in Peru, there's not going to be a railway line correct connecting Lima, which is the capital city, to Cusco, which is a major city. Um, in the interior of the country, what you're going to see is railway lines connecting places where these goods are being produced, going straight to the ports. So even as a way just to get around and as transportation within the country, these railway lines are really kind of completely inefficient. So the wealth in at this point in South America is based solely on the large landowners, um, and they are really, really vulnerable to the fluctuations in the world market. Um, in the last quarter of the 19th century, the world economy was undergoing a rapid expansion. There was something going on called the Second Industrial Revolution in Europe, in which science was being applied to industry, and this was creating a lot of new demands for things like copper and rubber in South America. So South America was getting a ton of money because of this. Um, their population is going to double to 43 million between 1820 and 1880. There's going to be a need for labor to extract these raw materials. So we're going to see European immigrants moving in large numbers. And we're going to do a little case study on this in regards to um, Argentina and Brazil. But there's also going to be new forms of bondage, essentially, for the lower classes, something called the peonage system, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, we also start to see the liberal reformers who wanted to change the colonial system, try to get involved and try to break the pattern of the colonial heritage and trying to kind of improve education and promoting individualism and private property. Um, but a lot of, in a lot of ways it didn't work. So the liberals came to power in the 20s and the 30s of the 1800s. The conservatives come back to power in the 1840s and they try to slow down reform because they were afraid of the lower classes getting too much power. Overall, trade in Latin America is going to increase 50% between 1870 and 1890. Um, but again, in the end, it's really going to be a system that's going to hurt the lower classes. We're going to have something that's referred to as the peonage system. And a peon is essentially a um, poor worker who doesn't own it, a poor farmer, so he doesn't own any land. He has to rent his land. Um, and essentially he is locked onto that land because he has to rent the land from the large landowner. Not only does he have to rent the land, um, he usually barely makes enough money to survive. So he's kind of locked in this pattern where he has to constantly be borrowing money from the large landowner. And as a result, he's locked onto this land based on debt. We're going to talk more about this when we talk about Mexico because this is a major problem there. But here you kind of see this is the overview of what's going on in the economy after Latin American countries gained their independence.